I'm going to read to you out of Exodus chapter 14, and I'm going to start with verse 19. Chapter 14 and verse 19, and then we'll talk about it. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians and on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. And not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on the right hand, on their right hand and on their left. And so the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. I thought about using this passage of Scripture today when I was... Um, when I came across this in my quiet time while I was in California, because it also, um, the text correlated with something that happened in my life that I was going to share with you while I was there in, uh, in California. But before I do that, let's lead up to this Red Sea experience. You know, the Israelites had been in bondage for over 400 years, in fact, 430 years, and finally God sent a deliverer by the name of Moses to deliver them from slavery and bondage so that he could serve them and become their people and take possession of the promised land. Before they could leave, though, they had to make a decision for the Lord. And that decision was to put the blood from the sacrifice of the lamb or the goat and put it on the three sides of the lintel of the door, on the top and on the sides so that when the death angel came and killed all the firstborn, everyone in that home with the blood on the doorpost, the angel of the Lord would see the blood, and so he would pass over, hence Passover. In fact, this story has been told um, for 3,500 years now. Um, the Hebrews still to this day, when they celebrate Passover in the month of Nisan, they relate this story, and of course God wanted them to do that so that they could tell the next generation, so that they would not forget, so that they would remember what God had done for them. And of course, we share the same story as well. Now, we don't celebrate Passover anymore because Christ fulfilled all the feasts, so you don't need the picture or the type when you have the real thing. And of course, we have the person of Christ, and we don't do that anymore because he fulfilled all of that. So the death angel passed over. Only He only passed over the homes of those who had faith. It didn't matter whether you were an Egyptian or an Israelite. If you didn't have the blood on the doorpost, the death angel would have killed the firstborn in your home. 
The Israelites needed to make a decision of faith for the Lord before they could go on. This Red Sea experience, some have um, associated with it with their baptism. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul even says they were baptized into Moses when they went across the Red Sea. Of course, Hebrews chapter 1 tells us we have someone so far superior to Moses, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we were baptized not into Moses, we were baptized into Christ. When we made the decision to be covered by the blood, if I can use that terminology, that's a decision that has to be made before you can go on with the Lord, before baptism can occur. And you want to know that you know that you know that you've made that decision. You want to know that you know that you know that when you die you're going to heaven, that your sins are all covered right now, that they are all forgiven right now. You don't want to be the kind of person where you say, I hope I'm going to go to heaven someday. No, you want to be the kind of person that says, I know I'm going to heaven. Why? Because I'm covered under the blood. Because I've made a decision to place my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, to receive him into my life. And I just wonder, maybe there's somebody here today who doesn't know that, who hasn't made that decision. They're not absolutely sure. Let's take care of that right now. Bow with me. Close your eyes. And if you want to know that you know that you know, you want to know that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord, pray this with me to him. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you died on the cross for me and rose again from the grave and you are alive today and you are the only way to the Father that I am a sinner and I cannot pay my debt and I need you, Lord Jesus, to forgive me. And so right now, Lord Jesus, I receive you into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And take me to heaven when I die. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. And if you just prayed that prayer for the first time, Jesus Christ just came into your life. Welcome to the family of God. By the way, how many times do you have to pray that prayer? Just once. That doesn't make you perfect. It doesn't mean that you're never going to sin again. You're never going to fall down. You're never going to get into trouble. But it does mean that you're forgiven. And it does mean that Jesus Christ is in your life. And he will never, ever, ever, ever leave you. Do you get that part? Because he loves you and he cares about you. Now, once you receive Jesus Christ to come into your life, guess what? You're covered by the blood. The blood is on the doorpost of your life. And so now you're ready to leave to make your exit from Egypt. The Bible says in Hosea, I think it is 11.1, 1, Out of Egypt I called my son. Well, in this day, it was Israel. Later, it will be God calling his son, Jesus Christ, out of Egypt when Joseph and Mary went and hid him there when he was a baby. Now we're ready to follow the Lord. So we come to this place by the Red Sea. And here the Israelites are hemmed in. This is not a military strategy. They got nowhere to go. They can't just run into the ocean there, run into the Red Sea, and yet this is exactly where God brings them. He's the one who led them there. He must have had something in store for his people. God knows exactly where to lead us. We wonder sometimes, though, don't we? I wondered, Lord, why did you lead me to California? In this doctoral program, I wondered that a lot. Was I... Was I just, did I miss a few meals or what happened? So much work and effort. No, the Lord, he did all of this. 
in my life. He leads us. We don't always understand it. He led Israel there to this Red Sea experience, and Pharaoh had let the people go, but he had a change of heart, didn't he? The Bible says, hey, wait a minute. We shouldn't have let these people go. These people are our slaves, and they did all this work for us. Who's going to do all the work now? Because Egypt was left in shambles. And so he hardened his heart, and, and God even hardened his heart further and so he got his 600 chariots, he's got all his men, he said, we're going to go after them, and we're going to bring them back. At first he says, okay, I'm going to let you go, I'm not going to be your master anymore, I'm not going to be your taskmaster anymore, but then he changed his mind, he said, nope, I'm going to be your taskmaster after all, I'm coming back, you're going to be my slaves again. There's something there. So he comes after them, and he's fixing to get to them, and the Bible says, and that's what really kind of got my attention where it says that God moved from in front of Israel to behind them. And he got there where he was in between Israel and Pharaoh and all his men so that Pharaoh couldn't get to Israel. Do you see that? And that's what God does. I thought, God, that's what kind of moved me when I was reading this text. Lord, you know, Whatever I need, if I need leadership, if I need counsel, if I need guidance in my life, you're in front of me leading me. But sometimes I need you in the back part. Sometimes I need you in the rear. Sometimes because I can't see what's going on back there. And there's some enemies that want to get to me sometimes. But you move in the rear and you protect me when I need it. So whether I need you in the front or in the back, either way, you're there for me. And this is what the Lord is, he's doing this. He's, he's giving this little... This little picture here for Israel so they can understand what he's doing. And, of course, he's telling the story through Moses. So they, um, the people complain, and they get upset, and they say, Moses, you, we told you that we didn't really want to leave. That's what they said in, in chapter 14. You said God sent you to deliver us, but we told you, no, we don't really want to go. We like it here. Did they tell him that? No, they didn't tell. You know what they did? They fell down and worshiped God. That's what they did. That's what the text says. They had a bad memory. And you know, that's one of the reasons God says over and over and over again to Moses and then later to Joshua, make sure you tell the next generation this story. Why? Because he knows a bad memory leads to bad things. You've got to be able to remember. And so tell the story. And that's why God instructed them to do it all the time. So they complained, and Moses said, you know, get out of my face, you know. And he got with God, and God said, here's the deal. Stick your staff out there so he does. And, and so God creates this wall, so he makes a way. He makes a way for Israel to get through the Red Sea. Why? He's holding back the enemies. Okay, holding back Pharaoh. So they, he makes his way, and they all go through there. And there's a bunch of them, so it's going to take a while to get over there. He made the dry land so they could do that. They get across, and so then when they're across, then God lifts his spirit up so that Pharaoh and his men can chase after the Israelites. And so they are chasing after them now, and they get into the middle of the Sea of Galilee, sea of the Red Sea, but the Israelites are already on the other side. They're already safe. And so what does God do? We all know the story. So he crashes the water back in, and it catches all of Pharaoh and his men. And then the Bible says, you, see, you remember how I slowed down my speech? And the Bible says, and what did Israel see when they looked at the seashore? A bunch of dead Egyptians. That's what they saw. Now, God wanted them to see that, okay? Now, let's go back to my story in California. So, been working on the doctorate thing, so it was time for my oral examination. <clears throat> so, I've been working on my paper since January of 16. That's a long time to be working on a paper. And uh, I got rejected once, my prospectus, and then I turned it in again, and I, they, they really liked what I did the second time. And then I had to finish my paper with um, 
with the project experience and working with 12 people in our church. So we did that this past summer. And then I had to write about um, my evaluation and my analysis and the implementation of what we did. Did I do what I said we were going to do in my prospectus? And tell me what happened. Analyze it. Evaluate it. So I had to do all that kind of stuff. So then what you have to do when you finish all that, you turn it in. And if they decide that it merits an oral examination where you can defend it, then they'll come back and say, yes, okay, you can come on this date and defend it. Well, my date, they came in the middle of uh, the third week in September, and they said, your date is October 18th. Be here at 8.30 in the morning in Ontario, California. There was no plan B. You'd just be here or else. So I said, okay. So I went out there a week in advance because they could ask me anything. I mean, I got all this Greek going on, all this research, all these professors, all these books, all these journal articles. A lot of the stuff that I wrote was a year ago. I don't even remember what I wrote. So I had to get in the library all day, and I had to, because they could ask me anything, and I had to be ready to defend it and not look like an idiot. And my life is on the line. So I, I'm in there all day studying, studying, and studying. As I got closer to the oral examination, something happened. I started to worry. I know. Y'all were praying for me. It wasn't working. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you, y'all were praying hard. <clears throat> you needed to pray harder. I was worrying. Now, what have I been telling y'all not to do? <laughs> For years and I was doing it oh and I was trying not to I knew that I was doing it It wasn't like it was escaping my memory I knew I was doing it and I couldn't it was hard to stop I really wasn't stopping it I was trying to stop it but it, I wouldn't have much success and I, I knew God was up to something here well and part of the reason what 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 uh, exacerbated the problem was I talked to one of, there's only, come December, there'll only be five of us that will have graduated out of a class of 30. And so I talked to one of the other guys that had graduated in May in my class, and he said, I said, how did your oral go? He said, man, they tore me up left and right. He said, I was so mad. He said, I just couldn't even think about it for a week. I said, oh, great. <laughs> so then when I got there, the, the day before I got there, the day before the oral, Brian showed up. Brian is a pastor in Salt Lake, and his oral examination was going to be an hour and a half after mine, same day. So he'll be the fifth guy out of the five. So Brian says, oh, yeah, Mike, I talked to Michael Cooper. He was not in our class. He was in the class before us. He said, yeah, I talked to him. He just had his oil. He said they ripped him to shreds. Said, take this out, take that out. You don't know what you're talking about. You just went crazy. I said, oh, this is not good. This is the night before. While well, all y'all are praying. I said, oh, man. So I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, you know, I think part of it, too, was that uh, this is the first time since I can remember that I spent a whole week by myself. And the only person to talk to is the waitress or the librarian. That's it. And I thought, well, this is the way a lot of people live today. They're by themselves. They lost their husbands. They lost their wife. They're single. And I thought, man... You know, that's really something. It was different. I was, I was so thankful, not only for my family, but for my church family. I thought there's a wonderful reason why God gave us the church, to give us this community that we experience. We were not only brothers and sisters, but where we're friends. And we have this fellowship with each other. Fellowship is a big, big deal. And it keeps us from feeling 
isolated. That we're not doing this by ourselves. When we pray for each other and we care for each other, that's a meaningful expression of God's love. So it made me think about that. But it didn't help my worry. So the next morning, I get up about 4 o'clock in the morning. I go to Denny's, and I'm witnessing the way. You know, that helped me a little bit. I was witnessing to the guy that was waiting on me at 4 o'clock in the morning. But then it started back up. And I kept saying, Lord, I know I'm not supposed to. I trust you. I'm resting in you. I'm resting in you. But I was still feeling the worry, you know, about what could happen. So finally, um, I get in there uh, about 8.15, Dr. Wiarda comes in, he's the New Testament professor. Dr. Watson comes in, he's the chair of the committee, he's the Old Testament professor. Dr. Wilson, who's the director of all the D-man program, and they sit there, and they, I'm going, boy, you know, what's going to happen? And uh, I had to apologize to them because, uh, you know, I can't even remember what their first little thought was for me, but I said I had to say I was sorry because my voice was so high-pitched. Because I, I said, I think my, my heart rate's at about 180 right now. And, uh, and you know how many questions they asked me in the hour exam to defend my project? Not one question. So your prayers did work. <laughs> your prayers did work. They didn't ask me one question to defend my project, they only wanted, they were just curious. And they said, in fact, after they dismissed me and called me back, they said, boy, we've been talking to each other. We're thinking, man, we need to start listening to the New Testament because they're big readers, you know, and I was taught my whole thing is about listening. The only thing they did was they were curious about what I had done and they complimented me about my project. And, and it was, and so all this, all this worry I had was for what? It was, a, it, was a, it was a fear that I had that was not well placed. Well, worry is never well placed. And the wrong kind of fear, you know, fearing God's a good thing, but all the rest of that stuff, it's not going to be well placed. Worry and fear are enemies that we have. Enemies. It made me think about this passage of Scripture. So where are we in this process if we just kind of draw something out of this text? We are not on the side of the Red Sea fixing the cross. We've already come to know the Lord and we've already been baptized, not into Moses, but into Jesus Christ, into his death, burial, and resurrection. In the person of Christ, God the Father baptized us into the Son. So where are we standing today? We're standing on the other side looking back. And when we look back, what do we see? We look at the seashore. So here's the problem. We get saved. We ask the Lord to come into our life. Maybe we did that today. And we've traded masters. We no longer have the master of worry. We no longer have the master of the flesh, the master of sin. We no longer uh, are under the kingdom of darkness. We are no longer under Satan's domain. We have left all that. We have gone across the sea, the Red Sea, and we are covered by the blood saying, boy, this is wonderful. And then all of a sudden while we're walking and doing our deal, one of those old slave taskmasters taps us on the back of the shoulder and says, you know, I changed my mind. I'm back. And I want you. And that's when we get into trouble sometimes because we don't have the proper response. That old taskmaster of worry tapped me on the shoulder. That old taskmaster of fear says, you know something? You have something to be afraid of, buddy. Do you know what they're going to do to you? And did they do it? Man, they, it was peaches and ice cream in there. 
they were so nice. Now, I had done my work. I had done my, you know, and that's part of it. Here's what we need to be doing. When those old taskmasters show up, when they come back and say, I've changed my mind, we need to have the eyes of faith. And we need to say, no, you're a dead man. I'm dead to anything you have to offer. There's nothing there. You're, you're, you're just dead. The Bible says about the uh, accuser of the brethren. Who's that? Satan, that God has cast him down. The Bible says, O death, where is thou sting? The Bible says that our sin nature has been crucified in Christ. And the Bible tells us, present tense, by faith, to crucify the flesh that we still have with us. And that's the one that usually gets us. That's the one that was dealing with me in the area of worry and fear. All those Satan's over there instigating, you know, all of that. So... You know what? I'm going to have a new perspective. So when I have these, these, this worry and this fear, when evil thoughts, anything that's not of God, I'm going to be stand, I'm going to see myself on that seashore looking back, and I'm going to say, no, my enemies are all dead. God's lined them all up, and I'm looking for the promised land now. I want to go where God is leading me, and I'm not going to be hamstrung. But I was, so I'm just, this is just honest Sunday, <laughs> just telling y'all the truth. Something else happened. I'm going to close with this one little story before we close today. Just a couple of minutes. So I, I had another boo-boo, okay? So I'm, I'm witnessing to a lot of people, you know, the people I come across or whatever, giving them tracks, and then on the plane I'm coming back, and I'm sitting next to this young lady, and her mother, and uh, she had, the young lady had been transferred to San Antonio in the Air Force and uh, from Hawaii, he, a civil engineer. And so um, they wanted to know what I was doing, so I told them, and they were all excited about that. And as the conversation went on, I realized and recognized they're probably not believers. I think they probably thought they were, but, I, you know, so like when she left to go to the bathroom, the mama says, hey, we got to get them into a, a, a Unitarian church. Do you know if there are any of those in San Antonio? Do y'all know about Unitarian churches? Unitarian, you don't need the blood. You don't need the cross. There's no sin, none of that. You don't need Jesus. No, everybody goes to heaven. That's Unitarian. I'm thinking, oh, gosh, how am I going to do all this, you know, in the rest of this plane trip? And I can't even hear on the plane because I can't hear very well on the plane. And I saw all these obstacles. And I thought, well, maybe I can just give her a track when they get the baggage because I didn't have it on my pocket or anything. And they got away from me and I didn't give them one. And the Lord said something to me because all this is about learning. And the Lord says, you know what you could have done, Mike? You see, you were, you were so you got this whole thing blocked because you're thinking because you can't say the whole nine yards, just don't say anything. You know what you should have done? What you could have done is you could have said to the young lady next door, you could have said, hey, have you ever heard of the scripture in John 14, 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. What do you think about that, what Jesus said about himself? He said, that way, Mike, you're, you're letting me speak for me. He said, let the truth do the job, do the work, instead of you feeling all the burden. And I went, man, that's liberating, Lord. That's awesome. And I can do that, and I don't have to hear what they say in response as long as I tell them what they're supposed to hear. Jesus is the only way, and we need to be sharing that message so that what? So that those people can experience what I've experienced, what you've experienced, all the enemies dead on the seashore. But you've got to be covered by the blood. Thank you for your prayers. Oh, by the way, 
they said you pass so so that was good so now you can officially call me Bubba that's my new title brother Bubba okay well let's pray we'll have an invitation thank you father for your word for remembering the story it's so important that we remember what you've done and apply it to our lives what you did for Israel that day in knocking out all their enemies so you have done for us much more so spiritually through Jesus Christ your son 